He's called the world a planet in crisis, also says America's leadership role needs to be restored to fix it. His new book addresses this. It's entitled While America Slept, Restoring American Leadership to a World in Crisis. He's Robert C. O'Brien, served as U.S. Representative to the U.N. General Assembly during the Bush administration, has advised Governors Romney and Walker on foreign policy during their presidential campaigns. Great to welcome you. Hey, it's an honor to be here, Larry. All right. Your book is very, very critical of the President Obama. So let me just start with a question based on he got Osama bin Laden, he confronts Russia, he supports the rebels in Syria, he drones more than any other president, he's more hawkish than President Bush, he, um, he deports more people than any, all presidents combined. What's the rub? Hey, look, to start with, I, I've never been critical of the president personally. I've never made an ad hominem attack on him because I think he's been a dignified representative and, and historic president of the United States. His and, popularity is almost 60 percent. You know, it's a strong popularity, and, and, and I think he's, you know, a good father, good man, uh, and, and I think he's done his best. The problem are his policies, and his policies have made the world a more dangerous place over the last eight years, uh, Larry. So. Uh, by prematurely withdrawing from Iraq, we had the rise of ISIS, which he downplayed as the JV team. By setting an artificial red line in Syria that was crossed, uh, we ended up with the worst human rights and, and possibly a genocide in Syria that we haven't seen since Rwanda. In the South China Sea, we've seen the, the Chinese build a great wall of sand. And in Ukraine, for the first time since 1938, we've seen a European power, Russia, invade a neighbor annex Crimea and change borders by force. So, so notwithstanding the fact that he's popular and a good man, the president's policies have really been a disaster for the world. Are you concerned that he's being replaced by someone who may go over the top the other way and in turn also be friendly to Russia? You know, I, I, I think that uh, President-elect Trump has put together an impressive uh, group of people for his, his new cabinet. Uh, I, I didn't support Donald Trump in the primaries. I did support him as the nominee, but I was with, with Scott Walker and then late in the primaries with, with Ted Cruz. But I have to say, the transition to me has been very impressive. Uh, to have General Mattis coming in as Secretary of Defense, General Kelly over at Homeland. He's interviewing some very impressive people, including Governor Romney, uh, Tillis, and others for Secretary of State. He's putting together a very solid team, and, and he's putting together a team of people that no one would, would claim would be panda huggers with China or that would be soft on Russia. So I, I think he's going to have a good team in place, and, and I don't see him uh, capitulate in any way to Vladimir Putin or, or Xi Jinping uh, or, or the Iranian mullahs, for that matter. Are we still the strongest country in the world? Absolutely. Okay. What concerns you the most? Uh, I, I had a conversation with a diplomat this morning. If I, if I was going to be the new national security advisor, and I won't be, I'm glad it's General Flynn who's got that, uh, that job and, and not me. But surveying the whole world, the most immediate threat is ISIS and Islamic terrorism. Uh, if that expanded and we had more San Bernardinos, more Orlandos, more Boston marathons here, uh, that, w that would change the character of America. I mean, it's already bad enough, as you know. My kids will never know what it's like to get to Burbank Airport and literally run to your plane <laughs> and, uh, and not have to go through a TSA line. So our lives have already been changed. It could change more if we can't get this Islamic terrorism under control. As far as the big power uh, concern, the, 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 the getting into a war with a competitor, a, a peer competitor like Russia or China, the, the East China Sea worries me. I think that if Japan and China uh, continue to butt heads over the Senkaku Islands, as the Japanese call them, or the Daiyu Islands, as the Chinese call them, that's a flashpoint that I think is under the radar, but is, is, is something we need to keep an eye on. Would you say the sleeping part started with, as George Will called us, the greatest mistake in American history, the invasion of Iraq? Look, in hindsight, the, the invasion of Iraq, the way that it played out was, you know, I, I think there are very few people that would defend it. Now, I, I do believe that the president at the time, and I was not in the administration at the time, uh, believed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And Saddam was systematically violating UN resolutions. He was firing at our uh, planes that were enforcing no-fly zones. He was a very bad guy. He was giving money to suicide bombers that were involved in the Intifada in Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me, so he's a bad guy. But he was anti-Iran. 
G G he look, didn't bomb. He wasn't responsible look, for 9 11. The, the, the way that things worked out and the fact that there weren't WMD in Iraq, you know, in hindsight, I don't, you know, I don't think most policymakers would have said that was a good idea. And, but, but I will tell you, when I was at the UN in 96 to 98 working on the Iraq issue, we were trying to determine, you know, if they had at the time, at the time of the first Gulf War, weapons of mass destruction, certainly chemical and biological weapons. Uh, and no one really believed they had nuclear, but they had a nuclear program. And all of the agencies that came to us, the Chinese, the Russians, the French, the Israelis, of course, the Americans who came and reported to us at the UN, everybody believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. So I don't think there was, a, I don't think Bush was lying. I don't think that, that the CIA was, I, they got it wrong, but I don't think people intentionally misled uh, the American oh, no, people. No one's saying intentional, but it was right. a mistake. It was, it, look, in hindsight, it was a mistake. You write a lot about China. You talk a lot about China. Are you concerned if, if Trump has it, does away with the one China policy? Look, that's a, to, to the Chinese, that's a red line. Uh, I do think what Donald Trump has done with the recent telephone conversation with, with President Xi in, in uh, uh, Xi, I'm not, my Mandarin's terrible, uh, <laughs> the, the, the new president of Taiwan, of the Republic of China, uh, was good in that it shook things up with the Chinese. The Chinese have been getting their way with us, uh, not just for the past eight years, but even in the Bush administration. Uh, you know, folks were very deferential to the Chinese. They took that as a green light for human rights abuses, for, for their adventures in the South China Sea, for threats against Japan and Taiwan. And I think that relationship does need to be reset and that the Chinese need to understand uh, that America has a role in the Pacific and that we're not going to be pushed out of the Pacific. I mean, fi you know, 50 percent, of the, almost 50 percent of the world's trade, uh, maritime trade, goes through the South China Sea. The United States can't cede big swaths of the Western Pacific to China, just like we wouldn't do it to Japan in the 30s and, and 40s, which ultimately led to the, the, the Pacific War in World War II. We have to be engaged in Asia. Asia, we can't be pushed out. And the Chinese need to understand that if they continue to try and push us out of Asia, that, that you know, the United States isn't going to stand for it. My guess is that the one China policy, and I don't, I don't know this, I haven't talked to President-elect Trump about it, but I don't think that will be a major change. Uh, but I think he's putting the cards on the table, and he's a tough negotiator, and I think he's letting the Chinese know that, you know, it's, it's going to be a new government. John Kennedy wrote a book and won a Pulitzer Prize, Why England Slept. Now we have While America Slept. Can you compare us to uh, England before Churchill? Okay, and it was a little presumptuous of me to use that title because, as you know, Winston Churchill wrote uh, is the, the title of his, his book that in the U.S. at least was "While While England Slept," and and I was that certainly was Kennedy's thesis in college, and he won a Pulitzer. And, and this isn't going to get a Pulitzer. I think it's a good book and a, a good <laughs> read, but uh, I'm, I'm not uh, JFK. But uh, uh, up until the Second World War. Uh, there, there was a real reticence on the part of the British people and a part of, on the part of the people in the West to watch what was happening in Germany. And, but the Nazis, when you look back on it, were very specific about what they were going to do. Uh, no one believed them because it was so outlandish and so preposterous. They didn't read the book. And they didn't, they didn't read the book. And they didn't pay attention to Hitler. And there was one guy who was, and that was Winston Churchill. Uh, keep in mind, when the Munich Accord was signed by Chamberlain, he came back to a hero's welcome in the yeah. UK. I mean, these are folks that fought the First World War. They'd lost a generation of young men in the trenches uh, just, you know, 20 years earlier. Nobody wanted a war. And we don't want, look, we don't want a war today. But Churchill said, you know, if you do this, not only are you going to, you're not going to avoid a war, but the war is going to be worse than if you stood up to this bully. I look at what's happening in Iran as, as very similar. The, the, the mullahs are telling us, and I was in the UN General Assembly as a U.S. rep when Ahmadinejad came. We walked out, so we weren't sitting on the floor. But when he came and said, hey, we're going to destroy Israel. It's a one-bomb country. We're going to wipe it off the, the face of the earth. Uh, look, you have to take what these people are saying seriously. When ISIS says we're going to you know, establish a caliphate, you have to take what they're saying seriously. And if you stand up to them early, I, mean, I think that's the lesson of World War II, and, and I think that's what proves Churchill right. If you listen to these, these madmen and you stand up to them, you can stop a much greater uh, uh, problem later on. You like his cabinet. Who would you like to see Secretary of State? I would imagine Governor Romney. I, I'd love to see Governor Romney as Secretary of State. I think John Bolton, uh, who I also worked for, uh, would make a great Secretary of State. But I, I, I think Mitt brings 
uh, a level of gravitas. He's a statesman. He's recognized around the world. Uh, he's got excellent character. I, I could just see Mick getting down off the blue and white plane in whatever capital he flies to and looking like the Secretary of the State uh, of the United States and somebody that we'd be very proud of. And look, politically, he also solves a, a Russia problem uh, to the extent that there's a perception, which I'm not sure is true, but there's a perception that somehow uh, President-elect Trump is close to Putin or, or would be willing to appease Putin. When you bring Mitt Romney into the equation, somebody who said Russia is the biggest geopolitical threat we're facing and was mocked for it, if Mitt goes and negotiates with the Russians and comes back with a deal, it's pretty easy for President Trump to say, look, I sent Mitt Romney. He doesn't like the Russians and, and he's a tough negotiator and that he, Mitt says this is the best deal we could get. It's the best deal we could get. So I think it makes sense politically. What are your feelings on the Russian cyber attacks? Uh, look, I have no doubt that the Russians would do whatever they could to interfere with our elections and our institutions. Uh, it's like they're, you know, uh, John McCain came out and said that Putin's a bully and a thug and a murderer. Uh, I don't think they, they did anything that changed the election. So I think folks attempting to use Russian intervention or Russian cyber attacks uh, to somehow say that President-elect Trump isn't legitimate or, or that he didn't win the, the election fairly or squarely, I think that's a bit of sour grapes. But we do have to get to the bottom of the cyber attacks in the United States. And they've come not just from Russia. I mean, North Korea did it to Sony. And a lot of your friends over at, at Sony had very embarrassing things released about them. We know the Chinese have a new plane that looks exactly like the F-35. And they got it because they hacked Northrop and, and Lockheed and, and, and pulled the, the, the specs. And they built a, a, a fighter bomber that looks very similar to our most, you know, we spent a lot of money developing the, the F-35 and the F-22, uh, the Chinese got the plans and they've knocked it off. So we, we've got to get very serious about these cyber attacks, whether they're to influence our politics, to steal espionage, uh, you know, or, or if it's just to, to invade the, the personal lives of Americans and, and uh, put our personal information on the internet. Thanks so much, Robert. Hey, what a pleasure. My, my pleasure. Uh, thank you, sir. The book, is, again, is While America Slept, Restoring American Leadership to a World in Crisis. It's now available everywhere.